Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Mark Raven. We're joined today for the fifth time on the podcast, a five-time guest now, Katie Anderson. How are you, Katie? I'm great. It's really good to be here talking with you again, Mark. Uh, and uh, I, there are a few, I don't know the whole list offhand. It's not like Saturday Night Live where they get a special jacket and you have a big deal. You're in the five timers club, but, um, but welcome to that club. And I'm glad, I'm uh, really excited. We're going to talk about your book, which is already out and already released. Those watching on YouTube, um, <laughs> see the book here, keep holding it up. For the audio listeners, going to emphasize the title of the book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, Lessons from Toyota Leader Asao Yoshino on a Lifetime of Continuous Learning. Yes. So, can, can, again, congratulations on that. Thank you. on that. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate all your support, too, in my, my book writing journey and um, how it all got started just five and a half years ago. Um, not the book writing part, but the writing part. Um, so it's, it was five it's and really half exciting. Ago, it was five and a half years ago when you went to Japan. When we first moved to Japan, yes, in January of 2015. And that's when I started my blog and you were so helpful when I was with questions about how to even get started with blogging. And, and that's when I met, I had met Mr. Yoshino before we moved to Japan. Uh, but we met, we, we met up in Nagoya for the first time in April of 2015. And a day that I thought was going to be a once in a lifetime experience turned into this, like it turned into a book in one of the most important relationships in my life. So uh, who knows how life uh, <laughs> can work out sometimes. Yeah. Well, so you know, today we're going to talk about the story of the book and what led to the book. And um, we're also we're going to talk a little bit about the process mm. of writing and publishing um, a book. So um, you've already kind of alluded to, you know, you had that opportunity to meet Mr. Yoshino. But, you know, what, what, what's the story that led to the book? It's a really good story. Well, the, the 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 meta of like even going backwards or just the you can, you can, I, I mean yeah okay. I mean you can t you can tell how you okay you'd like to tell it sure yeah so well the, the the first is like how did I even get to know this man and who is Mr Yoshino he is John Shook's first boss and mentor at Toyota when John Shook was the uh, very first non Japanese employee of Toyota Motor Corporation when they were preparing to expand globally and getting ready to um, do the new me uh, facility here in I'm in California. So near me in Fremont, California with uh, General Motors. And actually Mr. Yoshino was his boss. And how I came to know Mr. Yoshino is that I was at the Lean Coaching Summit in 2014. It was this month. Uh, so six years ago uh, this month that I met Mr. Yoshino. And he was on stage with John Shook talking about their experience of being boss and mentor. And there's actually a, a, a comment that Mr. Yoshino made on stage that struck me as really profound. This is before I even got to know him about what a leader's role is. And he was talking about his experience of um, being John's, John's manager, but he said, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, but this is, plays a big part in the book and also how I've been approaching leadership and um, really what I, what I see lean and, and, and leadership as well about being about, it's about leaders set the direction, mm -hmm. uh, leaders provide support, and they develop themselves. And if we do these three things, then we're really going to uh, be better leaders ourselves, but also really create that better leaders and better learners in our organization. Anyway, how it gets back to starting to write the book. I met Mr. Yoshino at the conference. He gave me his, his business card. He said, look me up when you come to Japan. Fast forward, uh, you know, six, seven months. I reached out. We set a date in uh, in April. And I thought it was going to be this once in a lifetime experience. Mm -hmm. I made my husband, John, take the day off of work. So I'm like, you have to come to Toyota. This is going to be awesome. Uh, it was, but little did we know that then that was going to develop into um, this relationship. So Mr. Yoshino gave me uh, his permission in that first meeting for me to write about our reflections from our conversations. And so that was both the, when I was beginning my blog and really is the genesis of this book, because I would come back and I would write sort of key takeaways from our conversations or aha moments and both things from Mr. Yoshino, but my own reflections of learning from that. And we continued, this became really the rhythm of our relationship. I, of course, took advantage of living so close to him and his generous offer of keep coming to visit me. So I would jump on that bullet train and, and go down and spend the whole day with him multiple times uh, through the time, the year and a half we lived in Japan. And from that, 
Then we started to partner together around the world with my Japan study trips and giving talks in the US and in Europe. Uh, and about two and a half years ago, he had this, he turned to me and said, well, maybe we can make a booklet from, you know, your blog posts and maybe, you know, make me, I love how you write about what I say and how you frame it. Uh, and so that would be great. And I thought, well, if we're going to do a, I knew enough about creating a booklet that that was going to be a big endeavor into itself. I'm like, no, we should do a book. If we're going to like go, go through this, let's not make a booklet. He's, he's got that, more than a, he's got more than a pamphlet's worth. Yeah. Of- yeah. Like this is, this, this is already more than a booklet. And I, so I first actually went back to all of all of my blog posts to see like, oh, could I just like repurpose them? But they were, you know, they're more like blog posts and they're sort of moments in time, some interesting com- content, but they'd have to be uh, massaged into, you know, use that content, but really create an article or something. So that this is actually going to be more work than than that. And I also knew that he had there was much more richness of stories and I'd gotten glimpses of it through the three years already that we had been friends and spending time together. Uh, and I asked him, I said, I want to sit down and do purposeful inter- interviews with you and, and, and let's start at the very beginning. And it was amazing. Some of these conversations, he was remembering things that actually, you know, they show up in the book of stories that he hadn't thought of in decades. Mm-hmm. Like his first is the, what we know now called the paint, the paint experience in the, or the paint debacle in his orientation when he was a 22 year old, um, you know, when he poured the, the wrong paint and solvent the, into the container resulting in hundred cars having to be uh, repainted and how his manager thanked him for making a mistake because, because it allowed him to like make the workplace better yeah. uh, to also then times where we really had to go back and revisit time and time again, this, especially that what I, the, 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 the water ski, boat decade, uh, which was a fail, failed business venture that Mr. Yoshino, it was his idea and he, he led the charge for. And it's a really fascinating story, but it, it took years of working together to really uncover what and unravel that whole story. So that, that's sort of how it came to be, but it was, and, and you know, because I, I, I'm sure we, we've talked about how I had to pivot in the structure of the book. I originally thought it was going to be like 10 leadership lessons or, you know, whatever number, but structured around the like principle or the lesson. And I was getting stuck writing like that. And also stories in our own lives or other people's lives transcend like one, like one lesson. And uh, when I freed myself to actually write his journey of how he evolved as a leader and how he evolved as a learner and let the lessons come from the stories, it really, uh, I I feel like I was, it was the aha moment for me and um, really is how the book has ended up shaping up. So that's the, that's the long, the long answer, but the, the, the full one. And when we talk about Mr. Yoshino's career and the connections to John Shook, mm-hmm. do I remember right that um, you look at the story in the book, Managing to Learn, that we have Porter and Sanderson, that, that was really Shook and Yoshino, right? That was Shook, yes. And so even Shook, uh, acknowledges Mr. Yoshino in the in his acknowledgments. It was uh, uh, two. It was he, the Sanderson character is like a compilation of okay. Yoshino and the actually Mr. Yoshino's direct reports, Ken Kinyeda. Those were who was the direct boss for John and in sort of the combination of their personalities together. Yeah. What was the character? But yes, I mean John, John. Uh, Mr. Yoshino's Hanko, his signature mm-hmm. is on John's A3, and he generously not only wrote the foreword to the book, but also mm-hmm. uh, allowed us to use a lot of photos from his time, including oh, wow. the, the top part of his um, A3 that Mr. Yoshino had overseen uh, him develop. And actually, is the story truly is the story of of managing to learn. Yeah. And and can you elaborate a little bit when you say the uh, the, the the symbol, the stamp? on the A3, um, that, that has particularly meaning in Japanese business culture or Japanese yeah, so culture more broadly? In, in Japanese culture more broadly. So uh, historically, people didn't have a, a signature per se. You get a stamp, like a seal, like a tiny stamp, and you use that to uh, indicate your, it's like, you know, you have like a little red stamp pad to indicate your stamp of approval. And you go, if you go to a train station, like the guy will get out his own personal little honko and he'll be stamping your, your ticket. And when it comes to professional documents and per, uh, in legal documents too, that's, that's how you sign something. And at Toyota, uh, um, a manager stamping 
his, and I'll say his because mm-hmm. historically it was all men, uh, his honko, his, his si- signature was a sign that he had overseen the thinking process of the document. So that he approved that he had done his job as a coach and a mentor of the person developing the A3. And I actually talk about that in the book too. Uh, so yeah. Can, yeah I guess so I, thinking I, about I actually, oh, I actually had my own Hanko, Hanko made, which is now my business logo as well. So I have a, a, a true stamp. And so like, I think when I, when I, when I can finally sign books in public together, I'm going to sign, but also put my, my, my ink stamp on, on the book as well. And, and so you, you, you choose a symbol that that's meaningful to you. Is that right? It's usually actually your, your name in kanji, which would be the, so it's usually your name, but I use my initials, KBJA. So, ah, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's see um, with the book. Um, so, I mean, how would you position the book to readers? Cause I, I think, you know, people listening to this podcast are, are going to love the book. Um, it, it's, it's more than, it's, it's not a, it's not a memoir. I mean, they're, they're a way of learning. The book is a way of learning TPS principles and lean principles brought to life through stories and the process of reflection. That's sort of my explanation of how, how, how do you explain it though? I think that's a, that's a good explanation of it, you know, but not, so those of us in the lean world who could, you're going to love it because it's this insider's history and insider's um, learning journey at Toyota. Uh, but other people will enjoy it too, because it, it's just, it's a, it's a story of, of good leadership and how to learn and about failure and success and reflection. And, uh, those who love Japan will in, in, will be intrigued by the Japanese history, but I kind of, I consider it sort of part leadership, part memoir, part, um, leadership book and part, in part history. Um, and told through storytelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I love process. I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to go ahead and talk about process. And I, <laughs> we, we, you know, there's so much content within the yeah. book. Of course, we want people to go buy the book and uh, check it out. It's available now in uh, paperback and Kindle. Yes, the Kindle version. version. The day we're recording this, the Kindle went live. So yes, you can you can get it and. It's you can read it front to front to back, or you can. Uh, I, I wrote it so that there could be like case studies of moments in time if you're interested in jumping jumping ahead to that uh, as well. And uh, I, I pre ordered the Kindle version and I was happy. I saw it must have been midnight Eastern time last night. I saw a little- yeah, it was all dropping it, 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 it was dropping at different times over like I, I could see that in Europe it was starting to drop earlier. It was interesting, like wherever yeah. people bought it. I got a notification in my phone on my Amex charge. I'm like, wait, what? I did, you know, but oh, and then I realized, oh, that was the, uh, they don't charge you until the book ships. Yep. yep. It's cool. Even when it's digitally shipping. So, um, but I mean, you know, so let, I'm, I'm curious. So you talked a little bit about the writing process where you, you had a vision for what you thought the book was, and then you ended up iterating. Is, is there anything more that you would add um, sort of on that piece of the process? Well, it was more something I learned about my, or I, not learned, but re relearned. And that's a word I use a lot in the book, relearning. So like how this, <laughs> we know things, but we know them more, more through time and through reflection that I am a heavy reviser. Um, my English teacher in college always said there were two types of writers, heavy planners and heavy revisers, but I am a, I'm a PDCA type of uh, continuous improvement mm-hmm. writer where I need to I figure my path out through the writing process. Um, so that, that was a, that was something that came, came clear to me. Um, the other thing is I really wanted to find a way in writing this book to have be clear that on Mr. Yoshino's voice in my voice as well. Mm-hmm. Um, because this is, I'm not, I, I wasn't approaching this as being his biographer. Um, we're really partners in this, even though I'm the author and he's the subject. And so I've I've called out in the writing process of his quotes um, in large text quotes in in italics or in bold to be clear on sort of the differentiation of our voice, but sort of like almost like you can hear the conversation of us of the of of the weaving of our own our, of our, our the conversation the stories evolving from there. Mm-hmm. So that was that was sort of an interesting uh, element as well. Yeah. 
And um, so when you're, you're revising, now we're, we're going to jump back to earlier parts of the process, but when you get ready then to say at some point, all right, book is done. It's different than like when you have a traditional publisher, they would have a deadline and they expect maybe that you're going to miss the deadline. At least that's what I've been told. They expect authors are going to be late, but you have this submission and you throw it over the wall to them. And, uh, you know, but when, when, when you, you are not just author, but publisher, like how, how do you decide to finally say, okay, yeah, it's done. Yeah. You set well, commitments, I, but you could push the commitment or how, Yeah, how? no, there's a certain point where the book needs to be done. And, and like I say in the, the book, like learning, learning is never perfect and it's never complete. And I would say the same thing about a book. Um, you know, a book is never perfect and it's never complete. And at some point you have to say it's a, a, a point in time. I mean, up until weeks ago when Mr. Yoshino and I would talk, cause we talk almost every week, he would have like this other gem that he would say, or he's like, Oh, I, I remembered something more. And I'm like, no, no time out. We, we, we can write some more blog posts or maybe we'll do the follow-up booklet or um, where you can sign up for the, the newsletter or the, the special access in, <laughs> that comes out of the book. Um, I have a web page for readers so they can come and get sort of supplemental uh, things. But I said, you, got, you have to, it could be never ending and never, never get out. And also uh, there's this Japanese concept called Wabi Sabi. And it's about um, appreciating the transience of the things we create in the, in um, relishing and embracing imperfection. Mm. And so I have had to lean, I'm just, I've had to embrace the concept of wabi-sabi, knowing that um, there are always going to be some imperfection. In fact, you know, there've been a few typos we've caught um, and a few, like one person's endorsement didn't make it in at the fine. And I didn't notice that, you know, but the nice thing about, so, the, about using a publishing platform that's more print on demand is now I don't have, you know, 5,000 copies right. of the book with some air sitting in it. It, uh, in a few weeks, I'll do a refresh rev. Um, so if you do catch a typo or something, you can collect them and send them to me and then they'll help make the next the re refresh. But Wabi Sabi is going to be part of this. And also, you know, I was, Karen Martin and I were talking about writing books and she's like, you know, you're always, your thinking is always going to continue to evolve. And so you have to just be okay with that this is where your thinking was at that moment in time. And, and that it's okay to continue as you're talking about the book and exploring other ideas, your thinking will evolve too. And so uh, to get to your, your point, I had, we declared uh, July 15th as the publishing date and by golly, I was gonna meet that date. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I had, we'd had some challenges given publishing in a pandemic and I, I had a moment of crisis, well, many moments of crisis, but, uh, as it related to the book in March, like Shook had already written his forward, like, oh my gosh, do I move forward? Do I keep publishing what to do? Um, but I, I took a pause and then regrouped and thought, you know what, this book needs to get out. Um, me holding on to it for like the perfect time also wasn't right. This book is about failure. It's about learning. It's about perseverance. And, um, you know, this is my opportunity. And unfortunately, the, you know, the book tours that Mr. Yoshino and I had planned aren't going to be able to happen now, but uh, I'm so excited that everyone can have, it's going to be poll based. You can get the book when you're ready for it. Um, and I, I'm not the, the, the rate limiter anymore. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you're talking about, you know, uh, defects in a mm -hmm. book that is shipped. Um, same was true with measures of success, which I um, self-published worked with um, contractors similar to the way you did. Um, but you could look at, uh, you know, gosh, the first edition of Lean Hospitals that went through a publisher had a typo on page one. And the typo was not in the manuscript that I had submitted. Somehow the typo spelling error got introduced along the way. But even a major, a really major publisher, um, Jeff Liker's book, The Toyota Way, had a typo on page one. Yeah. So, you know, so you think of like yeah. when editing is very much a sort of like, you know, uh, as authors, we're trying to write in quality, but there's also this inspection process of editors and proofreaders and um, stuff slips through. And you, I, I could think like, oh, yeah, people get fatigued. Mm. Like page one, whoever's reading page one, you'd think would be fresh. But it goes to show how difficult it is, I think, 
to publish. Well, and also, I think how things like change, like the typesetting gets moved around at the last minute. Like for um, one of our colleagues, the one of the letters on his attribution got cut off and that wasn't for me that was from when they were moving things around and no one's fault no, but there's a certain point you stop looking at, at like this is a 350 page book like I, I read it through many times but there's a certain point where other people are still moving things around and everyone's trying to do their best to catch things but the air is human and uh yep. it's a very human thing I also found it interesting I had a professional proofreader I had my editor I had me Mr. Yoshino yeah. um and we were all reading it, proofreading it, but we all caught different things. Mm-hmm. Some things we all caught, but most of them only maybe one or two people caught. And so it really showed that they're, you know, it's like the Swiss cheese effect. <laughs> it's like, and, and your eyes and your brain play tricks on you when you're reading something. You sometimes read what you expect to see coming instead of what's actually. Yeah. And also I've read this thing so many times. I love how it looks, but I don't want to read it for a long time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there's there's probably, you know, people in the audience who are thinking, you know, oh, they've got a book in their head, and, and most people do. It's a matter of whether they move forward with it or not. And, um, you know, one of the questions that comes up, it gets posed to me, and I, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thought process of deciding to go with a publisher versus mm-hmm. managing it and publishing it yourself, how you made that decision. Yeah, and well, thanks. You were you were helpful, and when I was exploring those different options as well, and we, we I remember sitting down with you. I think it was, I think it was two years ago when we were. It was like June when we were at the Catalysis Lean Health Care Summit in Chicago. Yeah. I remember we went. We were sit, having a drink outside uh, yeah. before well, both of us went to at a restaurant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and like I was picking your brain about the writing process because it was that time that I'd started to do some of the interviews with Mr. Yoshino, and. Um, I decided early on that I was likely going to self-publish. Um, the pro I didn't have a clear, like, so what I learned about the traditional publishing world is you really almost had to have your manuscript done and then you shop the manuscript mm-hmm. around and then you might wait another year and a half before it's published. And I was like, oh my God, this seems crazy. Um, I also was like, what I, I went back to like, start with purpose. So what is my purpose for writing this book? My purpose in writing this book was to amplify Mr. Yoshino's lessons of learning and leadership that I feel so grateful for having had this intimate relationship to be able to, you know, sit and talk with him for hundreds of (laughs) made thousands of hours and learn um, and, and let other people learn from that as well. So and then he's an old man. He's, you know, he's 76 now. It's like, you know, holding on to it another three or four years. I wanted it to be published and have him have, him have an opportunity to also relish this experience um, as well. So that was that was some of my thinking. And then as I got further down the line, uh, I did have some introductions to some traditional publishers and, and started to explore what that process was. But it just seemed I did I did have an offer from one publisher but then I was weighing out the 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 what I give up versus what I get. And for me, uh, I really decided at that point, I wanted to retain the ownership and control. I'd invested it already right. thousands of hours, like tens of thousands of hours probably in working on this over many years. And um, I really wanted, I didn't, I didn't want to just give it up. Um, and I, I think there, there are different reasons to go with a traditional publisher. And I think there are lots of different packages, different publishers can give, mm-hmm. but I ultimately decided um, that, that publishing this under my own imprint was the way to go. And I was also excited to learn about the publishing world and I've established Enigrin Press and who knows what I might do with that in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but what was also important to me, and, and you know, this as well, we've talked about, it, I didn't, want a self-published looking book. I don't consider, well, I am the publisher of this book. I don't consider it kind of self-published in the sense that I just like created a document and uploaded it. I hired an editorial team. I hired designers. I hired people to do all the things that a traditional publisher would do. And now I am a publisher. So, you know, so it's, I think there's a, a bit of a misnomer when people say self-published that can run the gamut of a lot of different. Um, yeah. Well, models. there's, you know, there, um, there's do it yourself and then there's being a publisher. So a publisher, the company hires, or they, they have employees or they subcontract out yeah. 
to different specialists. And yeah, I mean, being the publisher doesn't mean you're doing it all yourself. Um, there's there's some overlap in the network of, of people we worked with. I think of my own book, and, and I'm curious, you know, you can share some of your list. I, I had a book coach. Um, I had an editor who is someone I worked with before who was giving me input on um, content and copy editing. And you know, I had a book cover designer. Mm-hmm. Um, I hired, um, I, I, I did a lot of the Kindle. So I took a different approach than yours. I did Kindle first. And then I saw, okay, people are actually buying this. So I'm going to make the investment in the paperback. And I hired a company to do the page layout, um, yeah. the, uh, you know, to make the, the, a print book, um, to make the pages fit and the layout work. Yeah, and, and a lot a, of work. To a lot do. of precise work. And they hired proofreaders. And so, you know, and then you can hire someone to help with marketing and promotion. And so you kind of have this army of, of contractors forming a team yeah. to work with you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things I haven't talked about a lot is that I actually hired my a good friend of mine who is uh, an American living in Japan. Our friends were our sons were friends together in school, and she did the cover the cover art, and then all of the all the brush strokes that have become sort of the signature in my memes and the sort of the branding around the book. So that was also fun to to bring that in. But yes, absolutely. There's uh, this was not DIY it. Um, it would, yeah. We'd still be waiting many, many years to have the book come out if I did it all myself. Um, so yeah. here, um, for, and, and for those who are listening in the podcast, we won't get the benefit of this, but if you go to the blog post for the episode or search Amazon, you'll see the cover for the YouTube viewers. Can, can you hold the book up again? Yeah. Um, so can you kind of talk through, I'm sure there's some intent. You like talking about um, you know, being intentional yes. with things um, between the colors and the uh, the upper left. I'm yeah. sure there, what, what went into that? So yes, it, it was it was very intentional. You might it's harder to see. There's some uh, there's some uh, fainter lines coming this way. So this is a sort of graphical re- representation of weaving. So the concept, the metaphor of warp and weft. And many people know, and but many people don't know that Toyota was founded initially as the Toyota uh, Loom Works, so a, a weaving company. Uh, but this came out of conversations with Mr. Yoshino. I talked about his two, I, I felt like there were two threads of his life. And uh, we, he, we started talking about this concept of warp and weft. That warp are the threads that are, the vertical threads that are step, firmly established, they're known, they're high under tension. And then the, the weft threads are the ones that get woven in between. And I use this as a metaphor of how I structure the stories. I tell the stories on his uh, pursuing a known goal and then uh, a known goal and purpose. And then the other, which is the discovery of purpose of developing people and developing himself. Uh, so that was the intention. And then the red was, a, the red and blue, the sort of the indigo color is very traditional um, blue in Japan. And then we know red is off the you know land of the rising sun. But this also harkens back to Mr. Yoshino's love of American culture. So it's both, it's the integration, the interweaving of his life of both in Japan and in the United States. And, um, and really our relationship too, I'm an American woman in, you know, the mid forties and he's a Japanese man in his mid seventies who spent a lot of his career in the U S and I now have spent a lot of my um, you know, life in the last decade in Japan. And so it's sort of the interweaving of our own story as well together. Yeah. So, yeah I mean, looking, looking at the colors, um, you know, the, there's the red, white, and blue and the upper left in an abstract way makes me think of an American flag. Yeah, it's, it is. It wasn't initially intent. That was, it wasn't intended. It was to be the weaving, but how it has come through with the stripes and the stars and um, yeah. So there, there are a lot of metaphors you could weave together in there, but, um, right. but they're all true. Like Mr. Yoshino, his goal from the time he was a young boy was to move to the United States. And that goal is what set the foundation and the arc of his entire life um, to today. So, yeah. and also the, the incredible experiences and opportunities he had at Toyota are in many parts due to because he was, he learned English at a very young age and very proficient and then was well positioned when Toyota decided to expand to the United States to be the the person in charge of the training program and then get an assignment to the United States um, and be part of some of these 
uh, moments in time and these real inflection points in Toyota's history. So, um, so it all it all comes together, and it's what sort of the the meta story of this book is also the process of reflection. And sometimes we don't even see that until we look back. Like Mr. Yoshino is like, oh my gosh, you're right. I do have these two threads. And um, that's a, this is really my life and looking at this tapestry. And so helping him sort of rise up and see things at a, from a, a different perspective has been really powerful as well. Yeah, well, it, it, it it's, uh, really sounds like it's been a great partnership. And um, I, I think it's really a uh, you know, special product that um, has come out of that, that partnership and that relationship. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, those, those, those meetings, you were building trust and, and he felt safe and confident to kind of, you know, open up about some of these reflections. And uh, it's good that you were able to um, help get that documented and shared. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I think it's a really, these are important stories. And so I really, uh, I'm honored to be able to contribute to the sort of the lean literature this way and, and to help. And there are some stories and experiences that he did not want in the book, um, which I understand, but he's also very open to talking about them um, in person. So he just didn't want them in a book because some people are still living. So you'll have as a little teaser for come, come, uh, come hear us speak. <laughs> okay. And uh, hopefully things will um, start recovering and, and those opportunities will uh, become available or, th- yeah. or there will be virtual um, opportunities. And, um, you know, so as, as we wrap up here, um, unfortunately, we are a little short on time, but I'm glad we were able to talk about the book, which I really do like and recommend and, and to talk about the process. Our guest has been um, Katie Anderson. And again, uh, the book is Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. You can find it now on Amazon and it is available pretty much worldwide. Is that it's, uh, yes, all, all Amazon global sites. There are a few that are not sh- um, providing the paperback, but you can get it shipped to you and the ebooks available everywhere. You can also go to learning to lead, leading to learn.com. There are direct links to Amazon there and a bunch of sort of supplemental uh, information and sort of backstories uh, there as well. And you can also go to my website, kbjanderson.com for more information. Yeah. So thank you. And then the last thing I'll reference, um, I'll I'll put in the show notes, a link to the recording of a webinar that Katie did. I believe it was in May. Yes. I think it was the end of April or beginning of May. Not too long ago. It was part of the the Kinexus webinar series. And um, there are some additional lessons from the book shared. So you can hear Katie um, talking and presenting uh, about that. So again, Katie, thank you so much. Congratulations on the book launch. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye.